Hey there guys, it's Nick, the ASMR nerd, and welcome to another episode of Relaxing Reviews. Today we are, big surprise, taking a look at another mechanical keyboard. And this keyboard might seem quite familiar to you. You might recall that a few weeks back, I published a couple of videos that were sort of a hybrid DIY tutorial and review of a keyboard called the GK61, which was uh, a 60% layout keyboard, so a compact layout with hot swappable switches, so you can change out the switches as you like at any time. And that was available uh, as a DIY kit, but it's also available as a pre-built keyboard. Today we're looking at a very similar model, the GK66. Uh, as the name suggests, this one has 66 keys as opposed to 61 on a standard 60% compact layout, but it still fits those 66 keys into exactly the same footprint as a standard 60% board. And the big difference is a split spacebar. So your typical spacebar has actually been split into two kind of wide keys that can be actuated independently. And that gives you sort of a, a secondary function key, basically, which allows you to access additional function layers that you can customize and set up as you like. So this is potentially really useful for power users, whether you're, um, you know, setting up shortcuts for Photoshop or Lightroom or something like that, or whether you're using it for macros uh, in your in your games. Um, but addition, in addition to that, the GK66 has dedicated arrow keys, which is always nice, and a couple of other dedicated keys that you don't normally see on a standard 60% layout, such as the delete key. Uh, so all of these things make this an interesting board. Even more interesting, perhaps, is the switches on the GK66. It uses Gateron optical switches, which, although superficially very similar to a typical conventional mechanical switch, the way they function and the way they register your keystrokes is fundamentally different. They uh, Basically, when you press down on the switch, um, the stem of the switch uh, blocks an infrared beam that's um, being projected on the mother or the, on the the circuit board, the PCB, and that's how uh, the PCB and the controller know that you've depressed a switch. So there's no electrical contact made. And the claim is that this allows the switches to be much longer lasting and more resilient because there are fewer moving parts, basically. The contacts aren't going to get, you know, corroded or anything like that. So today I'm going to be evaluating the layout of the GK66 as well as the performance of these Gateron optical switches. And it's worth noting that just like the GK61 I reviewed, the GK66 does have hot swappable sockets, so you can pop those switches out, put switches in at your leisure. But my understanding is only Gateron style optical switches will work, which is a bit of a drawback because there aren't that many of those available. It really limits your switch options. Nevertheless, we're going to investigate the hot swappability of the board uh, and we're going to check out those switches. The GK66 comes in two flavors, actually. It comes in um, a Bluetooth-enabled version, which we're looking at here today, and that can work wired or wireless. And that's available for 76 US dollars through Banggood.com. There's also a somewhat less expensive model, which is wired only, available for 68 US dollars from Banggood. And if you like what you see as we're going through the review, there are, of course, links down in the video description where you can check out these keyboards. And there's a discount code for you down there that'll save you a little bit of money as well. 
Of course, Banggood has been kind enough to send over a review sample for us to look at here today. Otherwise, I wouldn't be talking to you about it. So uh, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to take a closer look at the GK66 mechanical keyboard. Let's get to it. And here we have the GK66 split spacebar in box, such as it is. Uh, this is shipped, of course, from Banggood, and it shipped with a DHL again. I've complained about DHL in the past. Uh, you can see the logo right there, maybe, DHL. Um, they are not kind to these boxes. Now, uh, granted, there's not much to see here anyway. The box is literally identical to the one that you saw for the GK61 when my, in my DIY keyboard review video, or key, um, keyboard tutorial and review. Um, so there's really not much to see anyway, but they just wrap it and tape and plaster it with all these barcodes and addresses. My hand is here because my address is featured prominently on, on this side of the box and the other side as well. Um, so I'm not even going to give you a box tour. I just want to show you that it showed up looking real rough. Uh, it got pretty beaten up too. Like it's pretty mashed looking. So I have asked Banggood to not send things via DHL in future. This isn't meant to be me ripping on DHL. That's not the point of this review, but I must say uh, I've not been impressed with their um, their shipping uh, in past. Anyway, not the point. The point is virtually nothing on the outside of the box in terms of telling you what's inside. So uh, not much to see here anyway. There is a Banggood sticker on this side, and that sticker says brown switch and it gives the skew but that's it um, I will also admit that I have actually uh, torn this open already <laughs> you can see here that was me that part because um, I was trying to get it open so that I wouldn't be struggling with it on video here uh, and there was just a lot of plastic and crap in the way as I was trying to open it and it was a bit of a mess so for all those reasons really nothing to see here. It's really ugly. Alright. Okay. I did not expect this to be illuminated when we opened it. <laughs> and yet there it is. Um, that's funny. Now it is battery powered. It is a Bluetooth keyboard. Uh, so um, it's totally possible that when you press a button, the lighting just comes on, uh, which suggests that there's no um, on or off, on off switch on this board. So anyway, um, we're going to have a real RGB unboxing here. Um, the interior, exactly the same as the last uh, GK61 that I unbox. Nothing in the way of padding except a tiny bit of cardboard here. Well, on all sides, I guess, but no foam packaging or anything like that. Um, and it's very crinkly, clear plastic bag to keep the dust off. Some accessories over here, which we'll look at in a moment, but let's just lift out this keyboard. Set it aside for just a moment. Um, here we have a user guide, which actually does look different than the user guide I received with the GK61, which is interesting. We'll take a look at that in a second. Let's, let's do the uh, accessories here first, though. So we have a braided cable, which is nice. Um, it feels pretty hefty. Uh, again, it's identical to the one included with the GK61. Um, yeah, it feels nice. It feels a little stiff, but the braiding feels high quality. USB Type-C. Gold-plated connectors. No branding, but that's okay. 
Uh, and it looks pretty long too. So honestly, uh, points for the cable there. Oh, would you look at that? So we've been giving, given some extra keycaps and switches. Did not expect that. Um, we'll open that up in a moment, but let's just pull this out. This is very, very primitive, low quality keycap puller. Just black plastic. Um, it's the clip type rather than the wire type. Of course, I prefer the wire type. They're better for your keycaps, but this will get it done in a pinch. And we have a metal, just very simple uh, switch puller. Because of course, this is a hot swappable board. Although, uh, as I mentioned, it is hot swappable with Gatoron's optical switches. I do not think it is usable with other conventional switch types, but that's something I'm going to investigate in this review. Just for you guys, because I love you. <laughs> okay, um, we'll discard this box because it's sad and gross. There's really nothing else to it, so get that out of the way. Look at what we've got in here. I see keycaps. I see switches. This will actually give us a good chance to look at Gatoron's optical switches. So, what do we have here? We have uh, a command key, another uh, six plus, which is seems to be the branding that they put on these boards. Although um, it's a total knockoff of the one plus branding for starters, like from a visual design standpoint. But also, I'm not sure what the actual name of this company is because on Banggood they're advertised as Geek. That's the company, but. That branding does not appear anywhere on the box or the product itself, at least not on the GK61, so maybe 6 Plus is the brand. Of course, their website is in Chinese. We have a control cap. We have an option cap. And we have another small 6 Plus cap. Um, I guess, I see this is, I think, an escape. This is an R5 height, so this must be for the escape switch, or escape key, or the top row, anyway. These are Mac conversion options, and I think this one is included if you don't want to have the angled um, 6 plus cap that's on there right now. I'll show you, you'll see in a moment, but the space bar or the switches, the, the keys that would normally be the space bar are split into three separate keys, and it is angled at a, a strange angle, um, as you'll see in a moment. So that's that. Um, these are uh, coated white ABS. They are not double shot. They are laser etched. Which, you know, some people like that. I don't really like it. I think it, I don't like the feel of the coating so much. It's a little bit more matte than, for instance, what Drivo is doing, but it's pretty much the same. Um, you get these nice sharp legends, like there's no doubt about it. Legend looks nice. But because it's not double shot, you know, if this coating ever starts to wear off or chip, uh, that's kind of it for the keycap. You start to lose your legends. Uh, and these feel kind of cheap. They're pretty thin. You can see it flexing there. I would say slightly below average thickness on these keycaps. Doesn't inspire a whole lot of confidence in the build quality, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see. These can make nice sounds.
we do make nice sounds. And then we have, somewhat generously, four uh, Gatoron optical switches. And I guess these are so that you can test out different kinds. <laughs> we have, what do we have here? Uh, colorblind Nick is looking. We look, it looks like a brown. Nope, that's a red. <laughs> nope, that's a, that's not, <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, my poor colorblind eyes. Yeah, these are reds, I think. Well, they're both linear, so we're going to assume that these are Gatoron optical reds. No bump. Smooth action, light actuation. Um, also weirdly short. Look at them. Isn't that weirdly short? Normally a switch housing is a little taller than that, I think. We'll compare them. Uh, I'll, sh I'll compare them later on to some normal switches. I didn't bring them here for the unboxing. I should have brought some other switches, but um, we'll look at them uh, afterwards because I think these are a bit short. And of course, no pins because these switches don't make electrical contact. Um, what they do, as far as I'm aware, is as I press down on the stem, you see how a little plunger comes through? That is being read or uh, monitored by a little IR diode on the motherboard, or on the PCB, excuse me. And uh, I believe when this gets close enough, when it reaches a certain point, that IR emitter can detect it and it sends the signal. So there's no physical contact between the switch and uh, any kind of um, electrical contacts. I have no idea how it's going to work, like if it's going to be good, if it's going to be unreliable, that's what we're here to find out. Now you can see black bottom half of the housing, clear tops, so that the SMD LEDs can shine through. Finally our board has stopped flashing quieted down over there. So we've got a pair of red Gatoron switches. Um, they have this box-like structure, which presumably is to help with wobble, although there's still very clearly some wobble there. You can see some play. Feels a bit rattly. And then these are a very rich, dark bluish kind of color, almost a navy color, but I assume this is what Gatoron Optical Blues look like. Let's see if it clicks. Oh yeah, she click. Um, so... Very basic click mechanism. Probably a click slider, just the same as a a cherry or a temu blue or whatever, your basic cherry clone. Uh, again, there's a little surround on the stem, probably to help with stability, but whether it does or not, <laughs> dubious, dubious. Um, same construction as the reds, otherwise the click is... It's, you know, it's a nice precise snap, but it's not nearly as nice as Kale's box switches. <laughs> I'm sorry to be that guy and always go back to the box switches, but uh, the click bar that Kale's box switches use is just so superior for a, a clicky type switch, in my humble opinion, because uh, you get a nice definite click on the way up and down, and it feels much firmer and snappier. These just have that bit of that rattle, same as a cherry switch, same as an Otemu, anything using this traditional slider mechanism. It may not be using an identical slider, it does feel a little different. A little less rattly than a cherry switch, but anyway. So, that's what we got. We got two reds, two blues. Okay, 
so those are the pack-ins, and I assume they're there just so that you can get a feel for uh, swapping out some of the switches using your your switch puller uh, and test out some other switches in case you wanted to buy them, say, and put them in this board. And these may in fact be the only other options for this board, um, especially because they seem so short. Uh, I suspect, and also the fact that there's no, you know, contacts. I'm pretty sure this PCB is designed only for the Gator on Opticals, but let's, uh, let's take a closer look at what we got here. Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Fooled you. Almost time to look at the board, but not quite, because we have a big old manual, which we'll take a quick look at here. It's actually pretty thick. G66 mechanical keyboard, packing list, board, USB cable, keycap puller, switch puller, spare switches, and keycaps. It has a photographic uh, description here, or pictographs, whatever, pictures <laughs> for how to swap the switches, or the caps, and the switches, nice and simple. Funnily enough, the switches they show in the pictures are different than what we just looked at there. These switches do not have surrounds around the stem. The blue color is a much more vivid blue. Okay, uh, what all our keys do? Backlight keys. Good, very good. Of course, this is a Bluetooth, so it's got a wireless connection. Different modes. F standard mode, DIY user mode, and DIY Mac OS mode. Got some different shortcuts. And function layer 3, which I suppose is accessed. Okay, here we go. Here's a company, Skylung. Skylung. That is different yet again from any uh, company I've seen listed associated with this logo, but from the community for the community. Well, that's very, very warm fuzzy of them. What does it say here? All keys except function key and backlight can be user defined in this mode. Press function shift or function to shift to this layer mode. That's FNX. I assume FNX is their function key. Release FNX to escape this layer mode. The onboard mode layer one, two, and three can be downloaded using their software. All settings are saved with the keyboard and are in effect anywhere, even if the driver is not running on the computer, so that's nice. It's got onboard memory. Function Q is the drive mode layer, some special function. For example, you may wish to assign a macro of more than 32 bytes to a key in the drive mode while it's unavailable in the onboard layer mode. I assume drive mode is a driver mode where it's using the driver rather than the onboard memory. Okay. Interesting. It's got a 750 milliamp hour battery, which is not that big, honestly, but probably big enough. And then it's got the same stuff, just in Chinese. All right, this is this is an interesting product. It's very different. Um, well, it's very similar in some ways uh, to what we saw with GK61, but the split spacebar design does enable some interesting functionality it looks like um, and it's quirky and it's optical switch design okay let's take a closer look at this actual keyboard first we must extract it from the very crinkly plastic i will attempt to make this quieter for you because last time you guys complained this was too loud <laughs>
That's still pretty loud. <laughs> we'll fix it in post. Okay, um, the lighting's just going off here. We've got our rainbows, because why not, right? Uh, first impressions are that this is very light. Uh, it's quite light and feels very plasticky. Um, we've got this interesting layout with, uh, it's all standard until you get to the bottom row. Well, in the bottom right corner, uh, as you can see, we've got a space bar that's been split into, uh, three or four. Does the space bar normally extend out here or is it in there? I don't even know. I feel like it's normally here. But that seems a little short. Anyway, definitely a non-standard bottom row. We got one, two, three space bar-ish kind of buttons. Uh, like space bar one, space bar two, and then function, I guess. Uh, right next to a menu key. Uh, and then the alt. And then we have dedicated arrow keys down here. Uh, surrounded by a very tiny shift and a delete. Otherwise, though, a standard layout. Uh, keycap compatibility here, not going to be great, unfortunately. If you're ordering different sets to put on this board, uh, you're probably going to have to pay up for something a bit fancier that comes with all kinds of weird extras. Uh, or if you can add that as an add-on pack, you know, often you can do that with the group buys, because uh, you're going to need some strangely sized keys for the, or caps for the, the weirdo space bar here, uh, as well as a very tiny shift and like a, a, uh, a non-standard height delete key. But all that aside, uh, let's, let's take a little look around here first. So, uh, these, the space bar and other space bar like keys here, you can see are sitting at a weird angle. And this is something that I've seen on enthusiast boards before. I think it's supposed to be for ergonomic reasons. And then your thumb naturally kind of sits at that angle. So you might as well have this canted space bar uh, that's more ergonomically sound. I think that's what's happening here. They're sort of mimicking a trend in the enthusiast community. For that matter, the split space bar is, you know, uh, kind of a grognardy thing. It's not something you see very often, but it is more popular amongst mechanical keyboard nerds. Um, but it gives the keyboard an interesting look with those canted uh, spacebar-like keys. Everything else, though, is a standard um, uh, scooped OEM profile layout. Nothing else weird there. R5, I guess, R4. I don't know, I can never remember what the names for the different profile heights are, but... Um, the case itself... Hmm. Uh, matte black pla black bleh, bleh, bleh. <laughs> Matte black plastic. Uh, ABS, no doubt. Around the sides here. Around the back. And the other side and the front. Uh, but above that, you have a glossy, rounded lip. The corners are rounded. All the corners. And then below that matte strip, you have another glossy strip, which is already looking really gross and fingerprinty, <laughs> just from handling it. Uh, I will never... I will never understand why manufacturers use glossy plastic in these high traffic areas. Like if I pick up this keyboard, I'm picking it up using exactly the surfaces that are glossy, right? If you pick it up off the table, you're picking it up like this, and that's the glossy surface. Anyway, whatever. I mean, it looks fine. It's just got to be fingerprinty. Uh, so these are all angled. So you get sort of this, you know, uh, smaller footprint. Uh, also, we have a built-in angle to this keyboard. It is uh, 
got a slight incline, probably five degrees ish. It's pretty shallow, actually. Worth noting, this case is probably identical to the ABS version of that GK61 that I reviewed the other day, or that I put together, you know, well, whatever that was, a number of weeks back, I guess. Uh, so if you were to get the ABS case version, this is probably what you'd get, I think. I'll double check that, but I think. Moving around the back, we have a plain black matte textured ABS surface. We've got four non-stick feet, no flip out feet, so you cannot adjust the angle. You're stuck with whatever this inclination is, which is whatever kind of typical for a lot of 60% boards actually. We have the Skylung branding made in China. Uh, some kind of uh, oh I see item GK66 just a product identifier there and that's it. <laughs> Nothing else to see. Very very simple. Uh, it feels kind of hollow in here. Has a bit of a hollow feel to it. Uh, and then, of course, on the back corner, USB Type-C, which is nice to see. Haha, <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> um, and that's pretty well it. Not much else going on here. So, uh, the most interesting parts of this keyboard are clearly not the build quality because it's not making a stunning first impression in terms of build quality. Um, the case feels functional, but a bit cheap. Those keycaps feel functional, but a bit cheap. <laughs> and really that's sort of the theme I'm getting here. The more interesting parts are in the software and configurability. So. Um, we will have a quick look at the lighting. Uh, we will also have a quick look at the software. I'm not going to go into great detail about the software because it's the same software, I believe, that I already looked at in my GK61 review. So if you want to know what the software on this thing is like in a broader sense, you can check that review out. However, I do want to dive into the configurability of the different function layers and the use of this split space bar. So that's what I'm going to focus on with the software, uh, which we'll look at in just a moment. Before we do that, though, you know what? In the spirit of uh, investigation, let's just pop off one of these caps and look at the brown switch underneath. What should be a brown switch? Very loud. Ta da! So you see why I don't favor this type of keycap puller, because to get it to grab on, I had to you know push it down past the edges of this cap. And I'm willing to bet. Well, actually, you can't really tell, but you sort of can. It's already kind of marred the cap a little bit, right? It's especially a poor mix or poor pairing. It's got a little scratch on there. It's poor pairing for these coated caps because those types of scratches are going to show up on this matte coating. Whereas if you just had a solid double shot ABS or PBT cap, uh, you probably wouldn't have that same problem. All right, so there's our switch. Very flickery LED. Uh, you've probably been getting that flicker all along. Actually, I do apologize. Uh, we will take a quick look at the lighting next. So. Um, you'll see more of the LEDs, but that flicker is due to the uh, shutter speed of my camera and the refresh rate, for lack of a better term, of the LED. I don't see any flicker uh, in person. Um, but yeah, apologies for that flicker. I didn't think we'd be looking at LEDs in this part of the video. You can see, though, the gator on. I assume that says gator on. I can't really tell from here. Um, but if I were to look at one of these other switches, I bet you it says gator on. Oh no, weirdly, these actually say something else. <laughs> these 
I'll say L E. Huh. What the heck? L E on the housings. Um and you know, actually, this is a different switch, because these these stems as well uh, don't have the box structure around them. So this is actually a slightly different switch than the extra packets they give us. It does say gator on, though. The included switches say gator on. And yeah, for the sake of interest, let's pop out this here switch. You can use this built-in, or the included puller, switch puller, just pop it in like that. Pinch and pull. So there we go. Oof. It's a little stiff, but very bright LED in there. Yeah, I do not see any um, contacts for a conventional switch. So this is only going to work with these optical style switches. Uh, the brown gator on. feels nice. It's got a very pronounced bump. More pronounced than a typical Gatoron brown, I would say. So these Gatoron optical browns have a very precise and snappy bump. Right near the top of their action. It's a very pleasant bump. It's much more pronounced than, than a Cherry MX brown, I would say. Significantly more pronounced. And it's smooth. Also, not too much rattle. I would say this is less rattly, with less play than these extra packins. Eh? Oh yeah, way less. Look at this. Watch this. Tons of play. Tons of rattle. Versus much less. Alright, so the actual switches on this board are apparently of better quality than the pack-ins, the extras, which is funny, but probably good. Uh, because I wasn't terribly impressed with these guys, honestly. Um, but aside from being, like, slightly weirdly short, they do seem slightly short, don't they? Don't they? Maybe I'm just crazy. Maybe this is standard height, but it seems short. Um, and not having contact on the bottom, it seems pretty much like a normal, a normal switch. Oh, interesting. Could you look at that? The actual mechanism is different too. <laughs> Sorry, I was going to move on with the review, but this is worth noting. This switch, you see, it's got a hole in the stem right there, the bottom of the stem. And when I push the stem down, it partially obscures that hole. And I think that is what actuates, or what sends the, the signal. I'm guessing, anyway. This actually doesn't work quite how I thought it did, which makes me wonder. Ah, okay, you know what? Okay, so this is a similar situation. I just misinterpreted, but if you look at the bottom of the stem there where it comes down, you can see it pushing through, and there's a little gap that gets obscured. So it's not about the distance from the PCB that that plunger is, that's not the key here. It's the fact that that little channel is getting obscured, however the design may be. It gets partially obscured here when I actuate the switch. Um, and, uh, gosh, this is going to be really bright, because apparently I don't have any way of turning this off. Actually, maybe I do. Hold on a moment. Let's see if I remember my GK61, how this works. Function, delete. Eh, there you go. Look at that. Lights off. Um, it's got... The, the, there you go. You see? That is the IR transmitter and receiver on either side of that socket. It's the big hole in the middle there. And on either side there's a little structure. I think that's what's shooting the IR beam. It's through there. Uh, and then when 
gets broken by that um, bottom of the stem on the switch. That's how it registers a keystroke. So that's a little different than what I thought, actually. Also, you can see the LED above it there. And you can see there's no contacts for a conventional mechanical switch. So kind of limited in the switches you can use, which is a real bummer. I'm not going to lie, I was kind of hoping that I might be able to snatch the, like take this apart, take the PCB from this board, put it in my case for the GK61, uh, and then use it that way, because that would be kind of fun. And I'd have an interesting kind of split space bar layout in that nicer aluminum case, but uh, I could, but I would severely limit my switch compatibility in doing so. And I'd rather not. Um, the back plate here, for what it's worth, is also plastic. I don't think I've seen that before. You almost always get a metal back plate. I'll pop off one more switch here. Oops, probably shouldn't be using the metal one to take off the uh, caps. Well, that's definitely the finish. Oh yeah, that one's scratched. So you can see how easy it is to damage the finish on these things. Granted, I used the wrong puller. That was metal instead of plastic, but still. That's why I don't like coated keycaps. They get wrecked easily. Don't do what I did. But yeah, I'm pretty darn sure that this is, is this plastic or is this metal? It doesn't feel, well, maybe it's metal. Honestly, not sure. You may not be able to tell from your perspective. I'm basing it off the feel. Um, okay, no, I stand corrected. I think it is metal. I think it is metal plate. Uh, it's just not cool to the touch, like I would expect metal to be, but that's just maybe because it's summertime and it's really warm. Um, so my apologies uh, to Sun Loom. Is that what it is? Sky Loom, sorry. Uh, you do pass the test. It looks like it's a metal backplate at the very least. I was going to be kind of shocked by that because I think in even the lowest end budget keyboards I've ever seen have had a metal backplate. Um, but it's not a great feeling board, I'm not going to lie. Like, let's do a flex test here because this will this will be somewhat revealing, I think. Okay, well, you know. There's a bit of flex, but actually it's stiffer than I thought it was. And um, there's very little creaking, so that's a good sign. Um, it just feels light. It just feels a bit cheap overall. The build quality is not a strong point. Anyway, we'll see. The choice of materials, not a strong point. Okay, friends, now that we've had that additional bit of investigation there. I do like the feel of these switches, actually. They feel all right. Let's turn that back, put that backlight back on. There we go. Um, now that we've had a chance to uh, look at this thing upside down and downside up and backwards and forwards, uh, let's go look at the lighting really quickly. I expect it's going to be very similar to the GK61, but we'll take a look. Um, and then we will get into looking at the programmability of the various layers in software before uh, the typing test. Uh, after which, you know how it goes, pros and cons, and then my final verdict. Let's get on with it. So first, let's talk quickly about the backlighting options that are available 
without using the driver software. And they are pretty limited, it would seem. Uh, the RGB backlights are uh, neither the brightest nor the smoothest I've seen, but they certainly get the job done. Um, they're probably the same LEDs used on the GK61, uh, which we saw a few weeks back. They look very similar. Uh, although, by default, there are fewer options without using the software. So, if we hold down Function and press uh, like left square bracket here, uh, it gives us this sort of button press mode where as you press the keys they light up the fairly standard option if we press it again we get the shooting lines another fairly standard option now we get the waves shooting outwards from the keys we're pressing and then, ah uh, yes, the sound reactive mode. I assume that's what this is. Yes. So uh, there is a microphone somewhere in here, probably a very, very primitive one that listens and you get the sort of, you know, uh, audio equalizer effect based on ambient sounds. And presumably it would bump along to some music and look pretty cool. Now, I know that some of you had issues with this in the GK61 uh, because it had the same mode. Um, some people felt that it you know, was a privacy concern having a, a, a hot mic uh, in the keyboard at all times, and I can totally appreciate that. Um, it is a little bit strange. <laughs> um, for what it's worth... Uh, I monitor all my network traffic with glass wire and I've seen no evidence of uh, the keyboard or the driver software trying to contact any foreign servers or anything like that. So um, I am inclined to believe that it's pretty benign that the microphone is in there just doing what it needs to do uh, for the effect, but I can definitely understand why some people might be uncomfortable having that. Um, my understanding is, based on a couple of people's comments last time, that if you really wanted to, you could open up the keyboard and probably physically remove or disable the microphone pretty easily as well. Uh, I'm not going to do that in this video. That's beyond the scope of what I'm going to do here. But if you were really dead set on getting this board and you really, really did not want that microphone, you could probably uh, modify it that way. Uh, so the only other option we have here is uh, if we, well, what I have on right now, this uh, color cycling, rainbow cycling option. You hold down the function key and press the right square bracket. And it just gives you this mode. You can, every time I press it, it just resets it. That's all. And that seems to be it. Uh, function backspace will turn the backlighting on and off function backslash I believe will pause animations I think that's what that means that little it's got a little gear with a pause symbol in it um, if you have them configured in the software uh, otherwise yeah that's pretty much it uh, there's brightness controls of course function and the uh, arrow keys up and down there are a lot of brightness steps which is nice that's maximum brightness there. Um, and then I believe the speed of effects is controlled with the arrow keys, plus and minus. How would you look at that? We're in a solid, solid lighting mode. Oh, that's because I had paused it. Of course. There you go. There we go. You see, it's paused on the red. Off it goes. It's going very quickly because... <laughs> I cranked the speed way up. Let's turn that back down. That's a little intense. Keep it slow. All right. Uh, so uh, the only other function here that 
I'm not even really going to show you because it's not terribly exciting, but you can switch between uh, Bluetooth devices. I do have this paired to my PC via Bluetooth right now. Um, you have three devices you can have it bound to. It's function Z, X, or C. To enter pairing mode, you simply hold the function button and uh, press and hold the uh, appropriate slot. So uh, that's really straightforward. Um, one strange thing is this appeared on my PC, like it detected it as a Bluetooth device. It called it like a ITON USB receiver or something like that. It didn't, you know, call it the name of the keyboard or anything, but it was the correct device and it did pair quite happily without issue. Uh, so no issues there. Let's get into the software. And I know I said I wasn't going to show you much of the software because we already went over it back in the GK61 review. However, I've updated the latest version of uh, the um, GK6X software that's offered by this company, and it's got a total UI overhaul. And also this particular board has a number of features that the other one didn't. So we'll focus on that stuff. Let's take a look at that software. Okay, so here we have the latest version of the GK6X software. Um, this was available on the manufacturer's website and it appears to work with all their GK series or GK6 series boards. Um, I will leave a link for it in the video description because the link that Banggood has, once again, is an older version of this software hosted on Google Drive and it does not work with this keyboard. You need a newer version for it to work. So I will put that link down in the video description. You can check it out there if you want. Um, I was able to download it, no issues, from the manufacturer's website. This is the latest version as of the time of recording. It is version... Uh, gosh, where are the options here? There. <laughs> uh, 6.0.0.12. So, uh, and a variety of supported models, I think, is what it's showing here. Maybe. It's a little hard to tell. And you know why it's hard to tell? Because even though I have it set to English, there's still quite a bit of Chinese here. So it looks like maybe this latest version of the software is not as well localized as the former version 5. Um, this one was released pretty recently, mid-July, recently as of the time of recording, anyway. Um, so, uh, it's a little bit tricky to navigate. I will say that this interface is slightly less confusing than the previous version 5, and it does look nicer, but it's still pretty convoluted and largely unintuitive. Um, so, by default here, um, it's telling us we have the GK66 RGB plugged in. It gives us our firmware version. We have three tabs along the top. Configuration, LE files, which is a lighting configuration. And we'll get to that again in a second. And macros, and it's got all these pre-recorded macros for different games. So, uh, these are all for League of Legends, Dota 2. They are helpfully all named in Chinese, so... I have no idea what any of them do. Overwatch, some Overwatch macros. PUBG is empty. But you can make categories. You can make new macro categories. And you can also record your own macros, just as one might expect. Um, and edit them down here. Nothing too out of the ordinary here. Relatively straightforward interface. Um, but all these pre-recorded Chinese macros are a little confusing, because obviously... Uh, well, I cannot read the file names anyway. Um, enough of that, though. So the real meat and potatoes of this board uh, is the fact that it has the split space bar design, which allows you to use half your space bar as an additional function key, basically, and access these other function layers. So standard layer is non-configurable, it is the basic layout as it comes out of the box. Um, but if we switch over to layer one here, 
we start to get some options. We now have per key configuration options and they are pretty extensive. Um, of course, you can click any given key. Uh, you can give it uh, a lighting configuration. So when it's pressed, uh, I guess it'll, oh, did you see that? Yeah, I noticed this earlier, check it out. There is literally an ASMR lighting mode that comes baked into this software. I did not make this. This is from the manufacturer. Uh, we'll take a look at it in a moment, but I thought that was kind of cute. I don't know if it's, you know, I don't, I doubt they expect this keyboard to be reviewed by an ASM artist. Well, maybe they do, but, um, I think it's more supposed to look like tingles. There's clearly an ASMR fan on the dev team, which I thought was kind of cute. Um, I'll show you right now, actually, just so we can take a look at it. We'll just go to driver mode here and we'll go to ASMR quick use. And it's this slow kind of fading of keys between different colors, um, kind of just mixed all over the board, almost in like a static pattern. I suppose we could speed that up, couldn't we? But anyway, um, I thought that was kind of fun. They've got the ASMR <laughs> setting. Anyway, getting back to these layers. So there's three different function layers that uh, are actually saved to the board. So as I mentioned earlier, layer one, two, and three are all uh, uploaded to onboard memory. And so even if you take your board to a PC or a Mac, whatever, a computer that does not support the driver software, you still have access to all your configurations that you've uh, created for those layers. Whereas the driver uh, slot here will only work if you've got it plugged into a PC or a Mac uh, that has the driver software installed. But it seems a bit more flexible and the effects take, uh, or the changes take effect immediately. Whereas with for instance, layer one, two, or three, you have to first save it and then apply to upload it to the onboard memory on the board. Um, so what I've done here is I've just set it so that the left half of the space bar triggers layer three, um, and the right one just acts as a normal space. And what that allows us to do is, I'll show you what layer three does, it is all the secondary functions for these other keys. Uh, it gives you print screen, scroll lock, uh, insert home, all those things uh, on, a, on a secondary function layer, uh, as well as all your F keys, your function keys up there. And you can see when we switch to layer three, it actually lights up the, the relevant keys. So if we switch back to layer one, and then I hold down the left space bar, you can see it triggers that layer. And so I can hold that down and go say two, and that'll activate F2, uh, which is in Windows. Anyway, it's like rename a file. I use that shortcut quite often. Um, so that's pretty powerful. And you can use that in any combination across all three layers. Any layer can reference any other layer and any button can do that layer toggle. Um, it just makes sense to me to have left spacebar do that because it allows me to do a lot of keyboard shortcuts one-handed very easily. Um, but the sky's the limit. You can also combine that with uh, macro functionality. Uh, and really there's a, an immense amount of configurability uh, that's available here should you want to go down that route. Um, you could have a layer dedicated exclusively to, you know, secondary functions for a game, for instance, uh, and trigger it with, you know, left or right space bar, whatever works for you. The only button you cannot configure is the default function button, which is this six plus button right here. And that makes sense because it's reserved for uh, other functionality such as adjusting the lighting and things like that. So um, it is pretty powerful. And on a per key basis, you have all these options. You can rebind it to any basic keyboard input. Um, you can, uh, I believe, use it to say launch uh, software or something like that. Um, like a shortcut. Where did I see that here? What is all this down here anyway? Oh my goodness. Different keys and then 
use. Okay, I don't quite know what this is about. You can toggle between uh, Windows and Mac mode down here, worth noting. I don't quite know what this combination key situation is. I guess it lets you rebind combo keys, like any of the modifiers. Gosh, these are lengthy combinations, and then any of the alphas with that, but I don't know what it allows you to use. <laughs> Just click use. Let's just click use and see what happens. Nothing. Okay. Oh, this is what I was looking at earlier. Yeah. So you can use it to toggle a uh, shortcut. You can, uh, I click, if you click this, it'll pop up a, just a Windows file browser that lets you direct it towards a, you know, a shortcut in your executable or something like that. I'm not sure why that's only available through the driver layer. Maybe it's a more advanced feature that's well, I guess that makes sense. It's not supported through the onboard memory. Uh, you need to have some something installed on the system to do that. So yeah, that's only supported on the driver profile. Uh, but anyway, you can rebind with all the basic keys, numpad keys, media shortcuts, sort of system shortcuts, uh, mouse actions. You can disable uh, individual keys or certain chunks of the keyboard, uh, or you've got your temporary layer switch, which is what you saw here when I was holding down spacebar. As long as I'm holding it down, layer three is active. Uh, and that's what that's telling us there. There's also a little guide here that tries to explain how to use things. Apparently function escape Q will clear all layers. Ah, yes, and that's right. You can use function and then uh, W, E, R, and Q. Uh, to switch between uh, these various layers as well as a toggle rather than a temporary function switch. These are the lighting toggles or lighting options that I already showed you that are uh, baked in. I guess you can't change those. So there we have that. Um, and that's really the, the benefit of this split space bar design. Like I said, it lets you uh, have that temporary function layer toggle uh, and you can sort of freely swap between those layers, and there's quite a bit of configurability there. I suspect that other people might find other uses for the split space bar that, uh, you know, for their specific use cases, but for me, anyway, it's a big boon to be able to hold down that space bar uh, and hit, you know, two, and uh, have that function as F2, for instance. Uh, really quickly, the macro settings, you can configure those here. Again, this is all set to lol right now, but you can pick your macro category that we saw on that other page. You can search by keywords, which is handy. Uh, and then you can bind those macros to specific keys or key combinations. Uh, for the lighting, here's a big list of lighting. Um, these are the default lighting options that come with the board. There's a lot of them. Um, let's just go through some of them quickly because they're kind of fun. Let's look at... Uh, uh, what? Spectral cycle. Oh, let's switch to the driver version here so that it's easier to oh, see wave. Let's do see wave. All right, so that's a little chunky looking. <laughs> Where were we at before? Windmill. It looks okay. <laughs> Spectral cycle. Yeah, it's nice. Four seasons as spring. Okay, I'm not crazy about that one. Colorful Waterfall. I find a lot of these to be pretty chunky. The animations are not especially smooth. Colorful Cloud Flying. Oh, I kind of like that one. That's cute. Seven Colors Gradual Change. I feel like we've seen that. Oh, that's changing by piece of the board. Weird. Then you can also highlight specific pieces of the keys. Also for specific games, there's a PUBG, LOL, Dota. Music, I assume that's the equalizer. CSGO, I love how ASMR is just by itself down here at the bottom. I could shout out, shout out to whoever added that, I don't know. If you're watching right now, Chinese software developer, shout out for your ASMR mode. Um, but yeah, it's, it's more or less what you'd expect. But there are 
uh, much more uh, options available under LE files here, where as we saw previously with the software uh, in the in the GK61 video, you can create your own lighting effects. Um, I believe you do that here. You can create it like, uh, let's call it test, whatever, create. There it is, we have test. Um, and uh, we can do, what, what can we do here? I know there's a way to do this. Gosh, this is a little bit confusing. Can't select a key. How do I edit this? There we go. Okay, so uh, we can select lines of keys, groups of keys. I don't know what logo does. Below, oh, the logo's in two pieces. Weird, all, none. Um, and then we can frame by frame uh, create custom animations. Um, we can also collect or uh, select just single keys. So if you really wanted to, you could make, I don't know, a happy face or something, animate a happy face, <laughs> whatever your heart desires. And we have uh, access to full RGB color options for that. You can do it by hex code as well. Um, and you can do it by effect on a per key basis by frame. So that's, that's a lot, it's a lot of options. All right, I think that's everything I wanted to show you here. I spent a bunch of time talking your ear off and going through all the software, even though I said I wouldn't. <laughs> but I think it was warranted because it is a new version of the software, totally different, you know, presentation and layout. I think it is an improvement over the older version, although it still has a ways to come. Uh, it's still not terribly intuitive. It's a little messy, a little confusing, but granted, fairly powerful, lots of configuration options. All right, uh, I'd like you guys to hear this keyboard in action. What about you? You want to listen? Let's give those Gatoron Optical Brown switches a listen with a typing test.
right, so we've now had a chance to unbox the board, give it a nice thorough inspection. Uh, we had a chance to look at the built-in lighting and then at the software and all the configurability options available there. And then we just heard a typing test where you guys got to listen to those switches and I got to test them out. I've been using this keyboard on and off for quite a few weeks now and I've had the opportunity to form some opinions about the usage experience. That's what I'm going to tell you about right now before we run down the pros and cons and I give you my verdict. So first of all, let's talk about those Gatoron optical switches because that is an interesting and somewhat unique feature of this GK66. So I've, uh, I've popped out a Gatoron optical switch, one of the very ones from the board that you can see right here probably. There you go. Um, and first thing that I was going to do was actually just compare it really quickly to a conventional switch. This is a, a um, kale box heavy burnt orange switch. It was somewhat comparable actually to a brown in its feel. They're both tactile switches. And just for the sake of interest I'll line them up here and you can see that uh, well, maybe you can, you can almost see. This is a little harder than I had anticipated to show you, but there. <laughs> They're basically the same size. I was mentioning in the unboxing that I thought maybe the optical switches were a little shorter, and they are slightly, the housing is ever so slightly uh, shorter, but it's not particularly noticeable. Um, so they're pretty standard size switches, honestly. Um, I just wanted to show you that comparison there, just for the sake of interest. Uh, but in terms of performance and in terms of uh, functionality, I was actually really impressed with the Gatoron Optical Brown switches. They are a very satisfying brown switch to use. They have a more pronounced tactile bump than your average Cherry MX or Otemu Brown. Um, it's really pretty noticeable, and I like that. I like a stronger tactile bump, personally. It feels somewhat comparable to what you feel from a Zelio switch, which are known for having a very pronounced tactile bump. It's not quite as strong, but it's uh, in the neighborhood, and it's certainly more satisfying than a Cherry MX Brown or an Otemu Brown, or even more satisfying, I dare say, than the tactile bump on the box heavy burnt orange switches. It's certainly more pronounced. Uh, in terms of the quality of these switches, I found all of them to be perfectly functional. I saw no chatter, uh, you know, double, double uh, actuations while I was uh, doing my testing and my usage. Uh, I also found them to be pretty smooth. Overall, very appealing switches, nice even activation um, uh, actuation force across the whole keyboard. So uh, as far as switches go, these Gatoron Optical Browns get pretty high marks. Something else that I actually noticed here just now, <laughs> staring at these, is that you might notice the Kale box burnt orange has kind of a gap up at the top there, and that's to allow the surface mount LEDs to shine through. Allows that light to come through from below. The Gatoron Optical Brown actually has kind of a plastic lens built in there, uh, which presumably, you can see that, there you go, it's catching the light, as opposed to sort of an empty gap. And presumably that lens uh, helps to diffuse the light and uh, make sure more of that light comes through from the circuit board and emerges out through the switch. So that's kind of a cool feature. I hadn't actually noticed that before. Anyway, um, overall, yeah, pleasant switches, uh, high marks, definitely one of the stronger points of this board is those Gatoron optical brown switches. Next, I want to talk about that layout. Uh, this board has a fairly unique layout between the split space bar design and then the bottom right corner that's got the dedicated arrow keys, dedicated delete key, a tiny little squashed right shift key. Overall, I found the layout to be really good. It's very efficient. It fits a lot of functionality. 
into a 60% keyboard footprint, especially considering the fact that you can access not one, not two, but three function layers um, by using the split space bar uh, for a temporary toggle for those function layers. And each of those function layers is totally configurable. I will admit that I didn't make that much use of that particular feature because I just guess, I guess I'm not enough of a power user <laughs> to need that many layers and that many functions, but I did find it useful to be able to hold down the left space bar half and uh, access sort of typical secondary functions like the F keys along the top and things like that. I found that quite convenient. So certainly if you are the kind of power user who can make use of all those, um, you know, function layers and all that configurability, then I'm sure that you'll find that quite useful on this board. Also, always happy to see dedicated arrow keys on a board. The dedicated delete key, also excellent, made heavy use of that. The only thing that I'm not crazy about with this layout is the tiny right shift. I found that instead of hitting the shift, I would often accidentally hit the up arrow um, and accidentally uh, return to the you know, the beginning of my row, for instance, um, or whatever. And that was just kind of annoying. So the one U sized right shift key for me was a major annoyance. Maybe that's just me and the way I type, maybe it won't be for you, but I thought it was worth calling out anyway. And of course the downside of all this kind of unique layout, the split space bar, dedicated arrow keys, tiny shift, all that, is poor keycap compatibility. Uh, and the keycaps that come with this board are totally functional, but not of the highest quality. I've certainly seen better, uh, and they're not my favorite, to be totally honest. They feel a little thin and chintzy, and that sort of coated ABS with the laser etched legends just, it just never does it for me. I don't know, I've complained about it before with other keyboards, like Drevo's keyboards, for instance, but anyway. If you wanted to replace these keycaps, you would have to spend up on a more expensive set that comes with extra caps uh, that could hopefully uh, fill those gaps. You're honestly going to have a really hard time with most sets finding uh, the right size of keys for that split spacebar design. That's going to be the real sticking point with most keycap sets. Of course, the more expensive sets that are available through group buys, um, they often have more sort of exotic add-on packs for split spacebar designs, so you'd be okay there. But uh, if you're looking for sort of cheaper off-the-shelf sets, you might have a hard time finding something for that split spacebar. Uh, other things worth noting is the connectivity was fine. Uh, the Bluetooth functionality seemed to work pretty well. It connected right away. Uh, I tested the range within my little home office area here anyway, uh, and it seemed to work from all over the room. I didn't bother taking it like down the hall to the kitchen or anything like that, but like realistically, who's using it from 30 feet away? Probably no one. Uh, so I found it to be certainly good enough. The connection was stable. I never dropped a connection. Uh, and uh, I didn't really perceive any lag, which is good because I've used Bluetooth keyboards in the past that did have some perceptible lag. So none of that here, at least not that I noticed. I will say though, if you want to use this for any serious gaming, you should probably use it in wired mode. That's just a good rule of thumb with Bluetooth connections because honestly, Bluetooth's kind of a crappy protocol for wireless communication. Like it's fine, gets the job done with this keyboard. I didn't notice any specific issues, but generally speaking, if you want optimal performance, just plug the thing in. So overall, the usage experience with the GK66 was pretty good. I don't have a whole lot to complain about. It wasn't especially noteworthy, but it wasn't bad by any stretch. And I did enjoy typing on those Gatoron Brown switches. They felt pretty good. That said, uh, perhaps the most damning thing I can say about this board is that it just, it doesn't inspire joy to type on. I know that sounds like kind of a weird thing to say. Um, but the point of comparison here, I have a couple other 
keyboards that I'm reviewing simultaneously. I do this sometimes and I'll kind of cycle between them and, you know, compare and contrast and things like that as I'm doing these reviews. And the GK66 is the one that I was least excited to use <laughs> at any given point. Again, not because it's bad, just because it just isn't a super engaging usage experience. And I think that comes down to the way it feels. I'm not crazy about the keycaps. The plastic chassis feels quite light. And when you're typing uh, and you're bottoming out those keys, they bottom out with kind of a, a light, hollow, thock kind of sound. Not like a good meaty thock, but like a light kind of. It's hard to describe. You have to use it. I think it just comes down to the choices of materials uh, and the weight of the board overall. It doesn't feel substantial. Uh, it doesn't feel solid. But it is totally functional. And to be fair, the other boards that I'm reviewing, which you will see reviews for uh, in the coming weeks here, are substantially more expensive than the, the GK66, like more than twice the price. So I really can't be too harsh on the GK66. In terms of functionality, those extra keys and access to the function layers is pretty good. And those optical switches uh, performed quite admirably. So overall, a pleasant, if not standout, usage experience. All right, so with all that usage experience stuff out of the way, it's time where I run down the pros and the cons of this particular keyboard before giving you my final verdict. And because I'm a positive kind of guy, I like to start with the pros. I did have someone suggest that I start with the cons and end with the pros, because it's ending on a positive note, but... I don't know, it's just tradition to start with the pros. <laughs> Maybe I'll mix it up one day, but for today, the pros. The first thing that I liked about this keyboard was the highly efficient layout. I really do appreciate packing as much functionality as possible into as small a footprint as possible. And the fact that we get those dedicated arrow keys, dedicated delete key, and access to all those function layers via the split space bar all packed into a 60% keyboard footprint, fantastic. So I really do appreciate the efficiency of the layout with this board. I also really appreciate that it's got hot, swap hot swappable switches. Shouldn't be so hard to say, hot swappable switches. Um, kind of, it does have hot swap sockets. Of course, the downside is that it only accepts Gateron-style optical switches. Nevertheless, it's worth calling out as a selling point that you could switch your switch type if you wanted. You can change the typing experience and the feel under the fingers, even if it is only with, you know, three choices, basically. You've got your clicky Gateron optical blues, your tactile optical browns, and your linear reds. I'm pretty sure that's all that's available right now. So it is restricted relative to other hot swappable boards that take conventional switches. But nonetheless, there it is. It's a selling point and I do appreciate it. Third thing I'd like to call out is those Gatoron optical brown switches. I actually found them to be really, really good. They are uh, more tactile than your typical brown switch. And I appreciate that. I like a nice pronounced bump. They have nice smooth action. Uh, there were there was no chatter that I observed. There were no missed keystrokes. And to be fair, I've actually used uh, optical switches before. Different optical switches. But I reviewed a keyboard from Bloody that used their proprietary optical switches. And I found them to be not that good. <laughs> uh, these Gatoron opticals are... Uh, substantially better in my opinion, so gotta shout out those switches, they were pretty good. And finally, I'd like to call out the configurability of this board. It is highly configurable, as you saw in the software there. There's three separate layers that you can store in onboard memory, and you can basically arbitrarily bind any key to any standard function, window shortcuts, mouse functions, also trigger macros with an extensive macro editor. So if you are a power user that could really make use of having that level of configurability, then I think you'd be quite happy with the options available on the GK66. 
That said, there are of course some cons that I'd like to talk about as well. The first of those is the build quality. While it certainly got the job done, this keyboard generally feels a bit light and cheap. Uh, and unfortunately that does impact my enjoyment of using the board when it feels like I'm typing on something insubstantial and a little bit kind of hollow and plasticky. I'm just not as excited to sit down and start interacting with it. And that is one of the draws of mechanical keyboards is it's an item that you are excited to interact with, something you look forward to using. And I didn't really get that with this board because of that overall kind of cheap plasticky feeling build quality. Another drawback of this board is sort of tied to that. As I mentioned, I wasn't a big fan of the keycaps. I thought they sort of felt cheap and plasticky uh, along with the rest of the board, and they are that. Uh, coated kind of uh, laser etched ABS design. They're quite thin, so you might want to replace the keycaps, right? However, the keycap compatibility of this board is very poor, and that's due to the unique layout, so it's a bit of a double-edged sword, really. I'm commending the board for its compact and efficient layout, but it does mean that if you want to swap out the keycaps, you're going to have a hard time finding a set that's going to fit properly, especially with that split spacebar design. Another restriction that this board has is the hot swap sockets. Again, as I was saying, I commend the board for having the hot swap sockets in the first place. I wish it was a standard feature on every keyboard, and it is becoming more common for sure. But unfortunately, as far as I can tell, this board is restricted to using Gateron optical style switches. The PCB is not designed for conventional mechanical switches, so that really cuts down on your options when you're shopping for new switches. Honestly, I'm not even sure where you buy new Gateron optical switches. I'm sure they're out there if you look, but I'm not sure where they're available right now. Uh, and you're restricted to sort of the basic switch types, your clickies, your tactiles, your linears. It could be that the options expand in future, but one way or another, you are quite limited in your switch options with these particular hot swap sockets. Something else that I'd like to call out, and it is a fairly small little complaint, but it's that right shift key. I found that very tiny 1U right shift to be aggravating, honestly. Maybe it's just the way I type, but when I go to you know, use my pinky down there to activate the right shift, n more often than not, I would say, I was hitting the up arrow key instead of the right shift key, or I was landing somewhere in between the two. Um, maybe this is just a quirk of the way I type, like I said, but I did find it pretty annoying. I was able to train myself after using this keyboard for a few weeks to hit that up arrow key less, but it still interrupted my typing flow. I had to kind of think about it every time I went down there to access right shift. So the small right shift, kind of annoying. And finally, I'd like to complain about the unintuitive software. You had a chance to see it uh, as I struggled through it there. It's better than the GK6 Plus software was previously, the stuff that we saw in my GK61 review, but uh, at least in some ways it's better. I think the layout is more intuitive, but the localization for the English version is significantly worse. After uh, I recorded the bit for you guys, I was actually playing around with it some more, and I encountered a number of prompts that were entirely in Chinese. I had to just guess at what they were saying. It was mostly like a, are you sure you want to do this yes, no type prompt, so it was easy enough to figure out, but uh, the English localization is not great, there are some features that are still kind of poorly explained and difficult to figure out. Overall, the software is just difficult to use and not especially intuitive. So what then is my final verdict on the GK66 mechanical keyboard? Well, it's a bit of a mixed bag, to be completely honest. On one hand, it has average to slightly below average build quality. It's got some layout quirks that I found somewhat annoying. It's got those fairly restrictive hot swap sockets that only take optical switches. And of course it has fairly unintuitive software. So 
I don't think this is necessarily the best keyboard for everyone at this price point. However, if you are in the market for a split spacebar design, you appreciate the efficient layout that uh, this keyboard offers in the 60% footprint, and you're the kind of power user that can really take advantage of highly configurable uh, options that this keyboard offers, all those function layers and things, then I think that the GK66 is a fairly strong contender, especially at its price point. The feature set that it offers at the price point is pretty darn good. And that, my friends, brings us to the end of another relaxing review. Special thanks, of course, to Banggood.com for sending over the review sample that we looked at here today. And if the GK66 is something you're interested in checking out and maybe purchasing, there are links down in the video description where you can do just that, and you'll find a discount code down there to save you a bit of money as well. And of course, any purchases made through the links in the video description also contribute to supporting the channel, which I appreciate very, very much. And of course, special thanks to all of you for watching. I wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for you guys, so thank you. I hope you found this review informative, and I hope you found it relaxing. And I look very forward to having you all back here next time for another episode of Relaxing reviews. Bye for now, guys.